Hey, it's Clint Griffin, Ace Networker, and what are WAN technologies or wide area network technologies? Why do we need those? Why do we need to know about them on a certification test? It's extremely important, and I'm going to be going through this series with you on WAN technologies. In this short video, I want to talk about T carriers and how they were the original WAN technology. Now they're still being utilized even today, but you're going to need to know about them. You're going to need to know what kind of frames they are, what kind of speeds they are. So let's get right into that without wasting any more time. In this short video for now, I want to jump directly to talking about T carrier lines and CSU DSUs and how those are utilized with WAN technologies to transfer data and information. Now you'll likely encounter some or even all of these on a Network Plus or other certification exams. In fact, WAN technologies, wide area network technologies, is a section you'll need to study and know anyway to get into the networking field. So let's dig into them a little bit here, but I want to keep them simple for you. We've looked at frames and packets and switching and cabling and speeds and lions and tigers and bears oh my. Now we're going to revisit those but at the WAN level which really in general is a lot simpler and easier to understand once we get into it here shortly. When the phone companies were all monopolized into AT&T back in the day we can say the monopoly happening at that time was actually beneficial to our advancement in networking. And again, more in detail on this and the new to networking course if you get into that. And I say the Monopoly was good at that time because they had to determine how to connect multiple analog phone lines across the country and the world. And I'm going to post another video later shortly, uh, actually going into more of that history of wide area network technologies, WAN technologies. But everybody wanted a phone and a connection. They wanted to be able to call each other from long distances. They wanted to be able to communicate with each other across those distances and the population was growing and the demand was growing. So back when all the phone lines were analog, AT&T, or rather Southwestern Bell, essentially had a monopoly on the telephone market and so they decided or compromised or conceded, it depends on how you look at it, as a single company at the time to start using digital transmission instead of analog to solve the issue of not being able to transmit analog signals over long distances distances. And again, I'm going to go into more detail on that in another video about why analog was so bad, but just remember that analog is a varying wavelength signal, and so when it picks up noise or interference, it doesn't matter if you try to amplify that and retransmit it over long distances, you're still picking up all of the noise, so it becomes gibberish. It's just a bunch of static and noise at some point, and it's not understood, so it's very difficult to transmit that. However, if you take an analog signal and convert it into a digital signal, which is just ones and zeros representing data or sounds or information, then digitally you can retransmit that and clear it up over long distances. So that's where we came in with the T carrier signal. And they decided to look at an analog signal of a person's voice and convert it into the digital with a sampling rate of 8,000 times per second and it would be enough to send it over long distances without compromising the integrity of the sound or the signal. And at that rate, at 8,000 times per second, they could easily transfer it back to analog on the other end. By the way, we need to discuss where we get our term modem at this juncture be before I go any further. Just real shortly, a modulator converts analog into digital and a demodulator on the other end of the transmission converts that digital signal back to analog. So from the word modulator and demodulator we get modem. So when you convert an analog signal into an 8,000 times per second sampling, it turns into a data stream of, you know, ones and zeros, better known as a digital signal. So 8 times 8,000 equals 64 kilobits per second, or kbps. This digital signal rate that makes up the basic slowest rate component of a digital part of a telephone system became known as a DS0. Every analog phone call was converted into a DS0 signal and then multiplexed into larger circuits. That was when they first started using digital, they were using multiplexers. And really the digital stream is now sent out over packet switching large-scale networks instead of multiplexers. Much more on that in upcoming videos too. Now they could then send that digital stream over to the correct telephone in the right state, city, town, location. Now just as we have Ethernet to define connections, speeds, and types of media for local area networks, we also needed to have a set standard for the types of cables, transmission media, and speeds, and basic operations at the telecarrier level across these long distances. These interconnections originally got the names T1 and OC3. OC3 was what they were using on the then new packet switched 
connections. And this brings us to what they called the first digital interconnections of the day, T carriers. There are several T carriers listed on the Network Plus exam as they are expecting you to know a little bit of something about them. And it's why I made this short video animation. The first T carrier, level one, was called the T1. This description was used to refer to a couple different aspects of this type of connection. T1 connection referred to the digital networking technology being used. When they talked about a T1 line, they were talking about the specific shield two-pair copper cabling that actually connected the two ends of a T1 connection. Similar to what we've talked about in Ethernet cables, one pair of wires was used for sending and the other pair for receiving. At both ends of the cable, you would have an RJ48C connector, which resembles, resembles only, an RJ45 connector, but it's made for the T1 cabling. Since T1 connections were point-to-point, -point, you would then have a CSU-DSU. Now, this stands for channel service unit, digital service unit. And a CSU DSU worked similarly to a modem in that they converted the incoming user's equipment signal, which was typically Ethernet, but whatever that user's equipment signal was, it converted it to digital for transmission on the T1 line, and then it would convert it from digital back to the user's signal that was needed on that network on the other end. The CSU portion of each CSU DSU unit protects the user's equipment from any lightning strikes or power surges or electrical interference that may occur on the T1 and T3 lines. It also stores statistics and provides loopback testing if you need to. Again, we'll talk more on that in other videos also. The DSU portion provides timing and does the actual converting of incoming user codes and converting them to the correct framing format and signal for transfer on the T1 or T3 line and back again on the other end of the transmission. So in a lot of newer networking equipment you find today, the routers will actually have a built-in CSU DSU with the correctly labeled ports for directly connecting the incoming T1 or T3 lines. They're not a separate box unit like they used to be. Also keep in mind that since a T1 was a point-to-point -point connection, you can only have two CSU DSUs on a single cable, one on each end. So that's the physical makeup of a T1 line, physically what it's made up of. Let's look at the actual signal and data format sent across these. The digital signal sent across a T1 connection was known as a digital signal 1, or what became known as a DS1 for short. Now, it's important to remember that a T1 is a point-to-point -point connection, and because of that, you don't need to have phone lines that call each other or that get routed or anything along that line. You also don't need addressing or address fields on a signal that's sent across that line, because they don't need to know where to be sent they're just going to the other end. The DS1 frame consisted of 25 pieces altogether. You will have one framing bit and 24 channels. Each DS1 channel holds an 8-bit DS0 data sample. The framing bit and the data channels make a total of 193 bits in each DS1 frame. These frames were transmitted at 8,000 times per second for a throughput a total throughput or up to 1.544 megabits per second. That's 25 times 64 kilobit per second DS0 channels. You've got 25 channels, each one is 64 kilobits per second. This process for having those frames carrying a portion of every channel of every frame sent on a regular interval became known as time division multiplexing, TDM. So for the Network Plus exam, remember in a DS1 signal, every 64 kilobit per second channel is a DS0. Now here's the unique thing about T1 connections. The CSU DSU on each end of the connection separates out each channel into a separate data stream and you can specify which channels go with a specific data stream. Since this system uses channels, a frame would continue down the T1 line even if some of those channels were completely empty. The other thing about T1 lines is that they were dedicated connections. Typically, you would lease them from a phone company on a month-to-month -month basis, and since they are dedicated connections, they are always connected. This quickly leads us to the T3 lines or connections. Now remember this for the exam. A T3 line supported a connection speed of about 45 megabits per second on a dedicated line, and it consists of 672 individual DS0 channels. For the most part, T3s are typically used by regional telephone companies, and they're used by ISPs for actually connecting to the internet. Also, E1 is the European digital transmission line that's used, and it carries a signal at 2.048 megabits per second, so that it has 32 channels, 
times 64 kilobits per second. That comes out to 2.048 megabits per second. And last but not least, there are E3 lines that carry, uh, basically E3 lines are made up of 16 E1 lines for a total speed of approximately 34 megabits per second. So to recap, make sure you know these four T carriers listed in this chart here and the basic breakdown of their frames and speeds.